So let's practice the plan, do, steady, act cycle on a real problem. I've borrowed this problem from statisticians because it has lessons that apply to organizations. It will give you the opportunity to test a theory. And it teaches us that the first step in systems optimization is realizing that we are dealing with a system. Systems optimization, by the way, is doing what is best for the whole system rather than just the parts. Here's a setup. Suppose that you are on a game show and you are given the choice of three doors. Behind one door is a contract for your dream job. Behind the others, unemployment checks. You pick a door, say number one, and the host who knows what's behind the other doors opens another door, say number three, which has an unemployment check. He then says to you, do you want to pick door number two? Do you want to switch? Is it to your advantage to switch? Well, let's find out. Let's test one of three rules. Only one of these rules or theories can be true. We'll design an experiment to discover which one. The first rule is that it makes no difference whether or not you switch. You may as well flip a coin. The second rule is that it is better to stay. The third rule is that it is better to switch. You'll now have the opportunity to test these three rules using the plan, do, study, act cycle. In a moment, you will shut off the videotape and your facilitator will lead you through the exercise just like the individuals you see here. The dialogue book explains how you could conduct this experiment with one person instead of two. I'd wish you good luck, but you don't need it. This is about learning, not winning. Once you learn, you can increase your odds of winning without the need for luck. What did you think would happen? How many of you were surprised at the results? Many people are surprised. If you repeat the experiment 20 times and you are not dealing with bent cards or psychics, your results will look something like this. If you flipped a coin, you won about 50% of the time, say 9 to 11 times out of the 20. Now if you stayed, you won about a third of the time, only 6 to 8 times. And if you switched, you won about 2 thirds of the time, say 12 to 14 times. Now before I explain why this is called a paradox rather than a parent, let me describe the method typically used to solve this problem. This method is called the reductionist approach. Do you remember Descartes' fifth rule? Reduce obscure and complex propositions step by step to those that are simpler. This problem has complexity. You are faced with three doors, one open, one chosen, and one more closed. Without questioning it, most people adopt Descartes' method of reductionism. The contestant knows that the open door does not contain the dream job. So faced with the complexity of three doors, the contestant's first step is to reduce this complexity to something simpler. But excluding the third door leaves the contestant with a fairly simple problem. Choose between two doors. But to exclude the third door is to incorrectly state the problem. The correct way to state the Monty Hall problem is not to question the probability of winning if one switches between two doors. Rather, you should question how the open door is related to the one you haven't chosen. If you must do this exercise alone, you have to wear the hat of both contestant and game show host. First, as a contestant, you choose one card. Now, to decide which of the other two you open, you must look at them both. To open the door, you wear your game show host hat. Now, here is the key. If the dream job card is either of these two unchosen cards, you win by switching. You never throw away a dream job card. You just throw away the no job cards. That is, if you switch, you double your odds of winning. Now, the difficult part of this problem comes from incorrectly excluding the third door because once you've done that, winning is a flip of the coin. But to exclude the third door is the wrong way to state the problem. Someone once found Einstein deep in thought and remarked that he must be struggling to solve a very difficult problem. No, he responded. I'm not trying to solve the problem. I'm struggling to state it. 
because once I've properly stated it, the answer should follow. The way that we state a problem immediately constrains the answers. For instance, if we decide that the education problem is a question of how we increase SAT scores, we've immediately excluded a host of important issues, like restoring joy in learning or preparing students for work. People are generally capable of solving problems. What receives far less attention is stating problems. Too often we enthusiastically begin to solve problems without ever asking whether the problems are correctly stated. Life differs from school in that in life we have to both state the answer and the question. My experience has been that few people understand this explanation without actually having done the experiment. And once you've done the experiment, you hardly need the explanation. Solving the Monty Hall paradox requires that you shift your method of thinking. New methods of thinking fall under the heading of accommodation, something greatly facilitated by experience. Consider the possibility that this paradox applies to your organization. Replace the door labels of one, two, and three with manufacturing, engineering, and sales. Or change it to commerce, treasury, and labor departments or change it to the names of people in a department in your organization. And this little exercise contains within it a number of lessons. You learn the best method by collecting enough data to calculate probabilities, not just by watching a single round. Also, many of you learned a better method by challenging the method you knew to be right. And you learn to look for relationships.